speak this morning on restoring our relationship and our fellowship with the Holy Spirit. There's a lot that happens in our Christian life, but one of the things I'm conscious of is that modern Christians, present day Christians, very often we struggle with our prayer life. We can be busy, but busy doesn't mean spiritual. And we must never replace busy with spiritual. Because it's our walk with the Lord that sustains us, not our busyness. And I've met over the years people who are working flat out in church and then they burn out and they backslide and they get discouraged and things happen. It's good to serve the Lord and to do things. I understand that. It must be the overflow. The thing we have to guard the most is our heart and our relationship with the Lord in the Spirit. Once that gets eroded, we must see or put all the brakes on and some way go back to the place where that is clear once again. And so I'm going to, we're going to look at a few things here and then I'm going to use a visual from the Old Testament just for fun and then we'll go back and apply some of the things to our lives. And I'm hoping by the end of that you will, it'll, you will see why I was excited about what God was saying this morning as well. Because there are things that our lives that we have buried there that need to be changed and that God wants to set us free from. So let's start in Ephesians chapter 4. And I'm going to read from verse 20. And the key verse that I want you to look at is in verse 30 where it says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And we're going to read all the verses around it, first of all, and then we're going to ask ourselves a few questions. So from verse 20, he says, Paul writes and he says, You have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. The only way we are taught by Jesus is through the Holy Spirit working in our hearts. It's something God does. Okay? Now, verse 22. That you put off concerning your old conduct, or your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and that you're renewed in the spirit of your mind. And you put on the new man, which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for you are members of one another. Now be angry and do not sin, and do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands for what is good, that he may have something to give him who is in need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another and tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God, dear children. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Now fornication and uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be named among you as is fitting for the saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking or coarse jesting, which is not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no fornicator or unclean person or covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of God. Now, some of those things that he wrote there are kind of rough, aren't they? Those are the kind of verses we don't read. We kind of skip over them. 
But here's the question. In all the things that he's saying, these things happen in, in people's lives, why does he chose to put and do not grieve the Holy Spirit in the middle of those verses? Because those are the things that grieve the Holy Spirit. That's what he's saying. He's saying, be careful, because you have lo there are things that have, uh, have grown into your lives, whether one or two or three, whatever it may be, of all these things that are in this church here. And he's saying, guys, all these things, and I discuss it, is a problem because I find that different people are struggling with different things, but there's a, there's a little bit of a problem here. Because they are there, you have lost your relationship with the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit would challenge you on each one of those. You can't do those things without the Holy Spirit going crazy, without your conscience being pressed, without God putting up red stop signs and saying, whoa, we don't do it like that, remember? He said, you have not so learned Christ. We learned Christ another way. So this is contrary to what we learned. That means the barriers are going up. And when the barriers go up and, and the Holy Spirit starts to talk and we persist, the next thing happens is that we lose our freedom in prayer. We stop, it's just like our heart goes quiet and we, we lose our depth of prayer and we start to pray for this and that and the next thing. But our relationship with God gets a bit clouded. Mm -hmm. And the issue that we have to ask ourselves today is how do we get back to a, a, a relationship with God that is sweet and clear and, we, and significant and meaningful? So we're going to start in Isaiah chapter 6 with the promises of God first, and then we're going to have a look at this little story from the Old Testament. So Isaiah chapter 6, one of my favorite verses in the book of Isaiah. And the, just the first three verses here. Where am I? Chapter 12, not 6, chapter 12. <clears throat> and in that day you will say, O Lord, I will praise you, though you were angry with me, and your anger is turned away, and you comfort me. Now the next two verses are amazing, especially when you take the Hebrew and you realize it's a prophecy directly that Jehovah is going to become our Savior. But we're not looking at that. Behold, God is my salvation, and I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah the Lord is my strength and my song. He has also become my salvation. And the direct translation is, He has also become my Jeheshua, God my Savior, from which we get Jesus Christ. He has also become my Jeheshua. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. What a promise. And when we get saved, God would open a well on the inside from which a new life is going to flow. He would open a well of salvation and we would draw fresh water from that. This is promise, Isaiah 44. Okay, Isaiah 44, verses 3 and 4. For I will pour water on him who is thirsty, and floods on dry ground. And I'll pour my spirit on your descendants, and my blessings on your offspring. And then it speaks about how they're going to grow up among the water courses. So God gave a promise to the Jews and to the church that I will pour water on him who is thirsty and I'll pour floods upon the dry ground. John chapter 7. Those two scriptures are very significant. John 7 verse 37. Jesus is on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And the first seven days, the Jews did sacrifice what they call for the 70 nations. During the Feast of Tabernacles, they sacrificed that God might bless the nations around about them, etc., etc. But on the eighth day, they sacrificed only for themselves. 
and they worshipped God and they talked about and they're bringing their hearts back before the Lord. And one of the things they did is they went down to the pool of Siloam and it wasn't written in the Old Testament but they had a tradition and the priest would get a golden censer and he'd take water from the pool of Siloam and while the sacrifice was burning he would take this water and he would pour it out either at the foot of the sacrifice or on it itself I'm not sure and he would mix it with a bit of wine and he would pour it out as though living water is being poured out upon the people of Israel he symbolizes something so while they are doing that, remember Isaiah chapter 12, remember what I read in Isaiah 44, verse 37. And on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. For he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living waters. He drove them crazy because they were pouring it out there and they were quoting. In fact, they actually quoted Isaiah chapter 12 on the Feast of Tabernacles. They would actually sing that as they're pouring it out. And along comes Jesus and he says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. I am Jeshua. I am Isaiah chapter 12. I am the fountain of living water. I am the well that is going to sustain you. I am the one who is going to take away your thirst. It starts with me, it ends with me. I am it. And everything they were doing symbolically, he stood up and he said, it is me and I am the source. Isn't it incredible how he tied those things together like that? But he gave us a promise. And that promise is the spiritual well is not found in our works. It's not found in our good deeds. It is found in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And we must never let that well go dry. But it does. As much as when we get saved, something fresh happens. And we, if you think back to when we first got saved, how everything was so exciting to be a Christian and God did things for us and how life was just a, the sun was bright and the grass was green and it was a wow. But then dry times come, don't they? And somewhere that well goes a little bit dry. And it's, it's, it's that well that's gone dry that I want to address this morning. And it's why it goes dry. And we want to awaken the well. We want to bring us back to a place, each one of us, where we are, we are ready to re-engage with things that God has for us. And so, I want you to come with me to a story in the book of Genesis. It intrigues me. And it intrigues me because it is such a clear parallel to what we're looking at. And that is, I want to talk about the story of Abraham, Isaac, and the wells that they dug. And we're going to go to Genesis chapter 20. And I'm going to go quickly. I'm not going to read all the verses in between. But just to give you a little bit of background here. Genesis 20 and verse 15. Abraham has come into Canaan land, but he meets, as he comes in, he's in the land of the Philistines, he comes across the king Abimelech, and the normal story of Abraham, Abimelech has a look at Sarah. Abraham says he's my sister. He wants to take Sarah as his wife. God tells him no. Big drama. And so finally, the Abimelech comes to Abraham and he restores Sarah to him. And he says to Abraham here in 20 verse 15, he makes it, don't forget, Abraham is just there with his family. He is nothing much happened so far. He says to him here in verse 15, and Abimelech said, See, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. So he's given Abraham the, the free tenor to move because he's a nomad. Abraham has tents. So he's basically saying, Abraham, wander around and camp, put your tent wherever you like. It's just you and Sarah and a few servants and 20 cows, whatever you've got. You're no problem to me. Just do what you like. Now, in those days, they didn't have dams. They didn't have water systems. They, the only way they survived was either finding a river or doing what? Digging a well. And there's my little well. They weren't orange like this one, but they would dig a well. And so Abraham would move along and he would dig a well. 
Then a year later, he would move somewhere else and he would dig a well. And so obviously he dug little wells all over the place because that's what they survived on. The herdsmen survived on the wells. So it's, it's written, you see just now, it's written into the scriptures like that, that Abraham was digging these little wells wherever he went. Okay, now, chapter 21. And verse, from verse 22 down to verse uh, 32, which I am not going to read the whole thing. But Abimelech comes to Abraham in verse 22, and he says an interesting thing. He says, and he comes to Abraham, and he says, I can see that God is with you in all that you do. Now he's watched this guy and he's realized, oh, hang on a second, his cows are multiplying very quickly. His sheep are multiplying very quickly. His, his camels are multiplying very quickly. This guy is growing in influence in my country. So now he comes to him and he says, I can see that God is with you. Whoever you serve, God has prospered you. And my friend, you're becoming a person of influence politically within my territory. Problem. So in this discussion, the only thing that Abraham brings up in verse 25, and he says, please, please don't cause me trouble. So Abraham doesn't say nothing. He just says verse 25. And Abraham rebuked Abimelech because of a well of water that his servants had seized. So he says, wait, 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 forget about all that. I want to talk to you about a well. So the story that was the most important thing to Abraham was, I dug this well, and your servants took it away. So the, the most important thing in their discussion was, where does the water come from? Okay. So then they have this agreement, and Abraham comes down here, and so in verse 32, and so they made a covenant at Bathsheba. And so Bimelech rose with the command of his army and he returned to the land. And Abraham planted a tree at Bathsheba. So Abraham and Abimelech agree, okay, you can dig a well at Bathsheba and Abraham, you are going to base your camp there. No more running around my country anymore. You are going to stay at Bathsheba and that well is your well. Cool. No problem. I've now got my well. I'm going to stay at Bathsheba. We're friends, off you go. And so we don't find much drama happening until Isaac comes along. So we go to Genesis chapter 26 and verse 1. Now, there was famine in the land, beside the first famine that was there in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. So what does he do? Isaac, the well in Bathsheba has run dry. There's a famine. So Isaac looks at this well, and he realizes there's no more water, and he looks down to where his father dug the old wells, and he starts to march off back to the land of the Philistines to get some water. He's actually on his way to Egypt, by the way. And on his, he gets as far as the land of the Philistines, and God says, you, my boy, stop. You're not going anywhere near the edge of Egypt. I made a promise to your father that you were to stay in that land, and if you stay in that land, I will bless you. So you stay. So instead of going back to Bathsheba, where he started, Isaac camps in the land of the Philistines with Abimelech or his son, because obviously the generations have gone on. And now we find that he starts, he stays there for a little while. Okay? Now... Come with me to, where are we going? Isaac, Isaac, Isaac. Right now. He remembers the land of his promise, and he starts to grow crops. In verse 12 of chapter 26, Isaac is growing crops, and he prospers, which means he's there for at least two years. Then Isaac sowed in the land, and he reaped the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And he prospered, it says in verse 14, and he had possessions of crops and herds and servants. And the, so the Philistines, at the end of verse 14, envied him. Now, the Philistines, verse 15, had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father, and they'd filled them with earth. That's crazy. 
all the wells that Abraham had dug in his journey when he was there in previously, the Philistines had come and they had filled them with earth and rocks and whatever. When a well brings life. A well is what you need for your cattle. Now Abraham is gone. Why couldn't they just keep the well and draw the water? Why would they want to fill the well so that it was useless? That's illogical. I read that, I'm thinking, hang on a second, a Philistine is crazy. Why does he do that for? You know why? Because it was Abraham's well. And they wanted to remove the testimony of Abraham and the memory of Abraham and the influence of Abraham out of their territory. They had wanted nothing more with Abraham to do. He's gone back to Bathsheba. We're going to fill in the wells. We're going to remove his influence. Everything. We wanted the story of Abraham gone from our land. It's interesting that the world does not want fellowship with the Christian. And what we have, even though it blesses them, they don't want. There's, we've got a little conflict going here. So I, Isaac comes back and he says, it says there, he starts to redig his father's wells. And every time he dug it, he found a bit of water. And every time he found water, the Philistines came along, the herdsmen, and chased him away and said, we want the water. They just closed the well in. Now he finds water. They don't want that well. The moment he finds water, what do they do? They come along and say, no, 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 this is our water. And he says he dug a well, they chased him. He dug another well, they chased him. He dug another well, they chased him. And every time they said the same thing, we want the water. But they hadn't wanted the water. They didn't want him around. What they wanted was him to go. Yes? And so we've got a little picture here of Isaac living in the land of the Philistines, but he's living in a state of compromise. He's not at Bathsheba. He's in the land of the Philistines, very close to Bathsheba, but not where God wants him. And it doesn't matter what he does. He can't live on his father's faith. He can't live on what his father dug. He can't live in what Abraham's testimony was. The world doesn't want it. And every time he tries to dig it up, they chase him. And they lie about that water. Because the moment he's gone, they fill it in again. Why? They want Abraham and Isaac removed from the land. Yes? So we must understand, right from the beginning, that the well that opens up inside my heart that the world it can, it does not mix with the world in any way whatsoever. Yeah. Don't think that the world can draw from this well and we both can share it. It doesn't work like that. They actually want to fill it in. And they want our testimony quietened down. Yeah. And they want our lifestyle shut down. Yeah. Yeah. And they want us removed from their presence because there's something about it that disturbs them. We've got to realize the richness of what Christ gave us is not necessarily appreciated by the world, yeah. even though it's living water. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Nice little story, isn't it? So now, off goes Isaac. Where does he go? He goes back here. And so, he finally has a problem. And in verse 23, it says that Isaac went back to Bathsheba. He went back to where he started. And God speaks to him. He arrives at Bathsheba, and, he, and the next morning, boom, hello, Lord. Hoo -hoo, we are talking again. And God says, welcome home. This is where I told you to be, and now I'm going to remind you of all our promises, and I'm going to talk to you again, because you are back where you should be, boy. Okay? Notice verse 24. Mm -hmm. Okay? Verse 25. And so he built an altar there. And called on the name of the Lord, he pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants dug a well. That's the first altar I can find Isaac ever built. Maybe I'm wrong. 
Isaac comes back from the land of compromise. He comes back to where he should be, and he meets God, and the first thing he does is build an altar of sacrifice and worship. An altar of repentance. An altar of restoration. An altar to, to the God of his father. An altar of separation from those Philistines in the valley. He builds an altar. Then he starts to dig a new well. And while he's building the altar and he's digging the new well, guess who arrives? Abimelech. With his captain of his guard. And they come to Isaac here at Bathsheba and they say, We need to talk. But we're going to make a covenant between you and me. This time, the covenant is going to be a little clearer. And they give each other sheep and goats and they make the covenant. And it's called a covenant of separation. Isaac, you stay there. And Isaac planted some trees and it was, okay, so from now on, this is a declaration that on this side of the line belongs to you and this side of the line belongs to me. And they shook hands and the Philistine said, now it's very clear, you live there and we live there. That's your well, that's our well. And we feel safe and secure because you are there and we are now here. They had to make a covenant of separation. No more compromise. And the, as they signed that covenant, Isaac's men came and they said to him, we have found fresh water in the well. Isn't that a wonderful picture? Once we have the separation, once we have the altar, once we have the point of restoration, the well opens up again. And we take Mr. Philistine and we send him home. Nice picture, isn't it? Yeah. You've got to kind of weed through the scriptures and look at it. But it's written, I mean, otherwise you ask yourself, why are three or four chapters dedicated to a well? Why did God write this whole story about guys fighting for a well? Is it just for historical interest? I don't think so. There's a, there's a great, nice, spiritual picture laid out there. And then Jesus turns and he says, on that great day of the feast, don't worry about these guys pouring out natural water here. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. So now we must go back and talk about the well of water that he has placed on the inside that our well has gone dry. You think we can do that? Ask ourselves, what happened? Have we left our Bathsheba? Are we standing and digging wells in the land of the Philistines? Are we drawing water from our father's wells? Are we trying to live on past experiences? What are we doing? Because we all go through a time where we experience a spiritual drought. Times go dry, don't they? And when they go dry, we tend to look elsewhere for something to help us not understanding that we need to dig the well a little deeper. All right, so now we're going to look at 1 John. Okay, 1 John chapter 2. I'm going to break this up now. Okay, right. You okay with my story? Yes. yes. I was going to just tell the story and I thought, I can't. I need buckets. <laughs> okay. First John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world or the things of the world. Anyone loves the world, the love for the Father or towards the Father is not in him. Now, all that is of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lusts, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Remember when I read all those horrible verses in Ephesians? Chapter 4? In the beginning? All those things, that, those things we should not be doing that they were doing? And it says, don't grieve the Holy Ghost? Same thing. So now, we're going to have a look at this. And I'm going to show you something. I bought some more toys. Okay. 
Let's take the first one. Do not love the world. So what did the Philistines do to Abraham's well? They filled it with soil and rocks and anything, right? So we are going to throw some rocks in our well. When you got saved, your well was clean. But you're slowly putting rocks in there. You don't need a Philistine. You're doing it yourself. Yep. Okay? How would we call the love of the world? What about living a compromised lifestyle? Like Isaac. He went down to where the land of the Philistines were because he, could find, he thought he could find some water there even though he was not meant to live there. There is no fresh water in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. But we are lied to because the world tells us that if you can only just change your radical way of living and live in a manner that won't upset us and, and confront us, we can get on together and you may still serve the Lord. So compromised lifestyle is very simple. It means living among the world or the Philistines, conforming to the way the community expects us to live. Living in such a way that the community is comfortable with, my, with their form of righteousness so that I don't do anything that ruffles their feathers. But I go to church. Now that includes, excuse me saying it, such things as social drinking and things like that. We do things whereby we are appeasing the standards of the world. We, we go to church on the one hand, but when we are with the world, we are just like the world. We like the world in how we dress. We like the world in how we live. We like the world in our value systems. We are like them there on, and at work. Nobody knows that I am a born-again Christian at work. I am a submarine Christian. I go under the water on Monday, and I come up on Sunday. Yes? And maybe on Wednesday I have a periscope. Or there's a Bible study on Thursday. I go along there, pop up for a moment, and then go down again. Nobody knows where I am. <laughs> Don't, there's no such thing in the, in, the, in the world as a submarine Christian that God knows. Do you understand? I'm not saying that we go and put Bible tracts on everyone's desk at work. Don't do that like you're a sinner, get saved. That obviously produces hostility. That's how I operated as a new Christian. Okay? I got myself into lots of trouble. My boss called me in my, when I was working at Dunlop and he, he said, listen, you're working very well and everybody likes you. Just leave Jesus out the equation. Because <laughs> I would stand on the desk at lunchtime and talk to the guys in the office like, you don't want to hear something. Can I stand on my desk? I want to tell you, you must get saved. <laughs> it didn't work very well. Okay? So I thought it was better to go to Bible school then. That's what I did. So now, we have put some rocks in there. What's the rocks you're throwing in there? Compromise. The love of the world. Compromise with music. Mm-hmm. Compromise with films, soap operas. You should never watch a soap opera. Ever. Where are they made? In hell. What, what are they teaching you? How to divorce your husband or your wife as fast as possible, have an affair. The whole thing is around immorality. We get so excited. Oh, I wonder what she's going to do next week with that new guy. <laughs> what are you doing? You're watching everything that is unclean and filling your mind with garbage. You can go to work on Monday and describe with a little girl next door who is not a sinner how you watched your favorite soap that you have in common with her and describe the latest scenes. No. You wouldn't, should not even know the name of that soap opera. You should tell her what righteousness is, though. Compromise. We start to put 
rocks in our well when we play games with the Philistines. Yes? So let's look at the next one, the lusts of the flesh. We've got two more. Two more rocks. The lust of the flesh. What would you call the lust of the flesh? Things that we can just add to the well. Slowly as I chuck these rocks in, the amount of water coming out is less and less. Did you realize that? Yeah. Now I'm coming to the well, I'm going, and nothing is coming out. <laughs> because I put stuff in, that's why. Yes? Yeah. The lust of the flesh. Would you consider immorality a lust of the flesh? I do. Would you consider porn? Yeah. I do. Yeah. Yes? You heard me say the other day, I think something like 60 to 70 percent of Christian men visit porn sites. It's, it's not innocent. I'm on my laptop and suddenly my, or my, my, my whatever it is I'm using, it just happens to jump bing, 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 bing to a little girl. Woo! I wonder how my laptop got there. <laughs> Now I must just watch it. It only got there because your finger took it there, right? And your finger took it there because your heart took it there. Yes? And your heart took it there because your heart is full of wickedness. Period. There's no room for any pornography in any man's life, man or woman, by the way. Another lust of the flesh is anything to do with selfishness, where I'm putting me above everything else. That's the lust of the flesh. Okay? Yeah. Materialism is the lust of the flesh. It's called idolatry. Yes? Yeah. I see all these nice new cars here. I mean, I love cars and stuff like that, but I see these nice new cars. Do you know, just think about it. When the first Model T Ford came out, there were young men on the side of the road thinking, oh, if I only had a Model T, the girls would love me. <laughs> oh, I can't, I have to have a Model T. I can't live without a Model T, right? You look at me like I would never own a Model T today, right? <laughs> you see, materialism is relative, isn't it? Yeah. The car that we think is we've got to have today, we won't want in five years' time. It's only because of image. It's only because of personal gain. It's only because of I want something better so that I can look better. In other words, I have taken my contentment with God and laid it aside and I've replaced it with an appetite for materialism to feed my needs. The moment material things feed my needs, I'm living in idolatry. Yeah. Right? My son and I have always liked the shape of your Ford Mustangs. It's like when we grow up, we're going to have a Mustang. I drove one the other day. It was very nice. I was going for a walk around the neighborhood, and there was a guy. He was re refurbishing his house, and in his driveway, guess where he had parked? An Aston Martin. I love Aston Martins. I love the lines. I walked past that, and I thought, Wow, Mustangs have gone. <laughs> Look at that thing, man. <laughs> I just changed my idol. <laughs> Is that quickly the human heart can change? I mean, I'm like, okay, in heaven I might get something. <laughs> I want to give you a, just a clue for covetousness. If you see something you like, just pray and say, Lord, I don't want that one. I want something just like it, and it's fine, you know? <laughs> but in all seriousness, you didn't get that. Some of you did. <laughs> in all seriousness, materialism is a dangerous form of idolatry. Because if I don't have it, I become discontent. Yeah. And I'm not content to live in a small house, I've got to have a bigger house. I'm not content with this, I've got to have a bigger one. I'm not content with this, I've got to have something else. Beware, because God may pick you up and put you somewhere where there's nothing. Yep. Will you serve God if there's nothing? Will you serve God if we don't have the luxuries we have? Can we serve God in a dry place materially? 
because he could very well put you there and say, now let's see where your loyalty is without all your little idols. Materialism is selfishness, and selfishness is, is idolatry, and it's the love of self, and it's the love of the world. And it puts rocks in there. Okay? Look at 2 Timothy. Chapter 3. This is a little verse here. One little verse. I want to find it here. Verse 4. It speaks of the last days. Men will be like this dangerous times. Don't worry about the rest. But the last part of verse 4, it says, Men will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That verse jumped out at me a little while ago. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. What does that mean? Entertainment is pleasure. Correct? Start your car. I need to leave in the next 30 seconds. <laughs> He's got one of these nice ones that you can press the button and starts quietly while we're still in the building. So. <laughs> lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Could you live without your television? I'm not swearing. Could you live without your access to the internet and to YouTube and to Netflix and to all the rest? How many hours in a week do we spend not on business on a screen, on entertainment on a screen? And when we get together, how do we entertain ourselves? Do we talk to one another, or do we gather and watch something? Because in doing that, we've exchanged time that we would normally have to talk, to fellowship, to share, to pray, to read the Word of God. We've exchanged it for something else. Pleasure has replaced my time with God. So we have no time to pray, no time to read the Bible. I mean. Can you imagine anything as boring as reading your Bible? <laughs> the pastor does that. But for us, it's so boring. When I can turn the TV on and I can watch and be entertained by something on, on the screen. We've lost our ability to reason. We've lost our ability to study. We've lost our ability to communicate. That's another story. But I'll, I will just digress slightly so you understand the serious of it. I am a fan of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. The younger generation knows not a thing who he is. A great preacher who never had anything visual, but he had a command of the English language that was second to none. And the problem is he spoke to minors. He spoke to the poor. He spoke to those who were semi-educated and he did not speak to the greed people you stand on the sides of the coal mines and preach but everybody there talked to one another and words were the vehicle of communication in that time only vehicle of communication they couldn't read or write a lot of them so therefore they thought in words and so in one of his sermons he used a phrase like this your heart, like a muffled drum, beats its way to the grave. He didn't stop and said, it was part of a sentence. And I lost you right there. Your heart, like a muffled drum, beats its way to the grave. Can you think of a, I read it like, what did you just say? Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. Where's our muffled drum? Here it is. Your heart, like this. Every time it beats you, one step closer to dying. <laughs> what a way to waken someone up. Oh, your heart like a muffled drum beats its way to the grave. And they go, woo! And you go, what? <laughs> Do you know why? We don't think in words. We think in pictures. 
We think in screens. We want someone else to think for us and we just watch. Entertainment has robbed us of the ability to study. It's robbed us of the ability to read and to pray and to hear God. We want something to be done for us. And we wonder why come we struggle to serve the Lord. Mm -hmm. I've got some more. <laughs> the last one. Pride of life. You can throw some more rocks in our little well. You should have bought some more. There's no water left in that thing now, you know what? Where's the water? It's running underneath. Can't come through. Why? Did God fill it? Did God take it away? No, I've been chucking rocks in there. Quietly. I didn't need a Philistine. I'm doing it myself. Yep. How would you call the pride of life? <coughs> the first one, top of my list, is attitude. Attitude. Do you know why we have attitudes? Because someone crossed my rights. I got offended. I got offended because my pride got offended. In other words, Mr. Mr. Pride on the inside is having a bad day, and because he doesn't get his own way and hasn't been treated right, he's going to sit in his corner and sulk. That's called attitude. Right? One thing my kids learned, and we'll talk more about it on Thursday. But if I corrected my boys, and they chose of their own free will to walk down the passage and slam that bedroom door, I chose <laughs> of my own free will to visit them in their bedroom. <laughs> Very quickly. Do you know why? I will not tolerate an attitude. You want to get an attitude, my friend? We will, we will have fellowship until my heart is clear. <laughs> There's no room for it. If you correct someone, yes, do something wrong, no problem. But when you sulk, and you go and have your little pity party, that is, that is a stench in the nostrils of God. It's pride in full-blown form. We're throwing rocks in the river, in the well. Anger. Same thing. What is anger? Just pride. What is unforgiveness? You're playing God. At the end of the day, you're playing God. You're saying, I choose to hold that. I choose not to forgive. I choose to be God. I choose to judge. I choose to set the terms. Judge not that you be not judged. What is rebellion? To authority. It can come in a hundred different ways. But right down in the bottom line, it's like a little boy sitting in church on Sunday. But he wasn't sitting in church. I can't do it on the stool. He was standing on the chair, looking over the back, pulling faces of the people, distracting the meeting. So his father says, sit down. He says, no. So finally his dad grabs him by his pants and calls him down. Poof, and he sits on the chair. He says to his dad, I'm standing up on the inside. <laughs> Are you standing up on the inside? Do you have a discussion with your husband or wife? You stand up on the inside with your boss. You walk out there, he's told you to do something. I have to do it, but I'm standing up on the inside. Like really standing up on the inside. You don't know how much. It's called rebellion. And every time it happens, ding, ding, ding. Now you want to go and pray. And God, God looks, and the, and the Holy Ghost is under the well. It's there. But you can't access the river. You grieve the Holy Spirit because of the nonsense and the rocks. And like I said, we don't need Philistines to do that. We go to their shop and we buy the stuff and do it ourselves. You heard what God said in the gifts this morning. There's stuff in your hearts that have been there for years. Rejection is one of them. Amen. 
Rejection is, is, it can be nothing more than introvert pride. Throw it in there, I'm feeling sorry for myself all day, and I want people to know how sorry I feel for myself. That's pride! It's quiet. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to Isaac? He went back to the altar. You can't get that well clean without an altar. You cannot get it clean without an altar. And God forbid that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me, and I have been crucified to it. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. Memorize it. God forbid that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me. I am sat down with Abimelech, and I have signed a covenant of separation, and I have told him, leave my life, and leave my house, and leave my mind, and leave my lifestyle out. And I have made a new covenant with God, and I have a covenant with Jesus Christ, by which my life is now separated unto Jesus Christ and to his service. I have met the cross, I am crucified unto Christ, and the world is crucified unto me. And what have I done? I've, I've dug the, the, that well with all its rocks and all its nonsense, and I've thrown it away, and I've started to dig a fresh well in the presence of God. Amen. And unless we are prepared to let God put to death these things in our hearts properly, we will simply carry the rocks around. Yeah? yeah? You know what you're going to do? You're going to come to church, have an altar call, and give God a rock, and go home. And there's another 20 inside. Yeah. You're right. And then what happens is, two weeks later, you put that one back in there. And you give God another one. And that one's back. And you give God another one. Stop playing games. Stop taking out an, a rock on Sunday and putting it back on Wednesday and coming back next Sunday and taking out another one and exchange them. Get rid of the lot. Amen. Amen. Empty that well. Break your heart before God. Look what David said in John in Psalm 32. He committed adultery with Bathsheba, and he gets confronted. And he gets confronted in front of everybody. Bad story. Verse 3. When I kept silent, my bones grew old, and my groaning, through my groaning all day long, meaning I was convicted on the inside and something happened. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, and my vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Does that sound like a dry place? Does that sound like his well got dry? It sounds like he was cut off from God. He was physically not well, spiritually not well. He was walking around thinking, I'm the king and I have the right to do what I want. And oh, I am so sad and so unhappy. I'm the king and I have the right to do what I want. Oh, God, where are you? I'm the king and I have the right to do what I want. It sounds like you? Lord? I have the right. It's my right. I just want to do this. And yet my spiritual life is in tatters. And I come at church, oh God, if only I could meet you. God says, what about the world? Uh, not that. Lord, if only I could meet you, but I have the right to live my life on my terms. Don't do it. Verse 5. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I'll confess my, confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave me the iniquity of my sin. Remember the other day I discussed iniquity? Sin is little things we do. Iniquity is deep-seated, pre-calculated thoughts. And so what does he say here? I confessed my sins to you and my iniquity I will not hide anymore. There. And I confessed my transgressions to the Lord, and he forgave me all the deep-seated, calculated things in my heart, and my well was free. 
That's called repentance. That's called what he says in Psalm 51. Look at it here. Okay, same story. Verse 16. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings, meaning going to church and singing songs and doing those good things. The sacrifices of God are what? A broken spirit and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. There comes a place, folks, each one of us, where we have got to stop playing games with these little guys here. Realize that they are enemies. Realize that we've carried them in our back pocket for years. Realize we've used justification. Realize that we've played games with God. Realize that all these things are no longer cool. And somewhere we've got to go back to the well that he dug in our heart in the very beginning and let the rocks come out and once again have a solid, clear, fresh relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why it says in Hebrews that we have a high priest who was tempted in all points like we are, and yet he understands us. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. You see, when I come before God, he doesn't see all these things. For him, it's under the blood of Jesus. Once I come to the Lord and I break my heart, he says, you know what? I gave all those away. They died on the cross with me. They don't belong here. I don't see them anymore. All I want to do is make sure that there's living, living waters available for you to drink from. I am the source. Don't block it. I am the source. I will renew it. You can't do it ourselves. All we do is bring our hearts and let him do the rest. Simple? Like my pictures? 